Welcome to the Probate Realtor Show, your one source for selling and buying real estate through trust and probate. Hear directly from the best attorneys and trusted advisors on how executors and administrators navigate the probate process in and out of court. Being a personal representative or successor trustee can be a daunting task, and often beneficiaries don't have a clear plan. Let us help you make the right decision for your clients, your family, and your legacy. And now, here's your host, the probate realtor himself, Matias Baker Mazzucci. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode. Today, we are talking to Daryl Harriman. Daryl, welcome to the show. Very happy to be here, Matias. Um, Daryl is an estate planning attorney who doesn't just specialize in estate planning. So he doesn't just do your plan and then see you. He also specializes in the administration of probate and trust, which is a key important role in this world of estate and probate that we talk about. Uh, today, we are going to discuss costly mistakes in estate planning and probate. So Daryl, let's get right into it. My first question to you is, uh, could you explain the potential consequences of putting children on title prior to uh, a parent uh, passing away. So some people think, you know, I'm going to avoid probate. I'll stick it to the probate man. I'm just going to put my kids on title of my, of my real estate before I die. And that's going to be a great idea. Why is not that a good idea? <laughs> yeah, well, it, yeah, I see this all the time. Uh, you talk about costly mistakes in estate planning and the costly mistake here is doing your own estate planning. Right. Uh, you, usually for most people, the most valuable asset they have is their home. Mm -hmm. And instead of getting some expert help on how do I do this, they just decide, I know, I'll just put my kids on title with me. Or another mistake I see is they just put one of their children on title mm -hmm. and tell them, oh, well, you just share it with the others doesn't always work out the way they planned. Right. But the, the reason why it's almost universally a bad idea is a thing called stepped up basis. If people understand the idea of what a capital gains tax is, if you make a profit on the sale of your home, the government wants you to pay a tax based on your profit or your mm -hmm. capital gain. And the question is, what do they use as the starting point for mm -hmm. measuring that profit? Well, if you buy a house and you sell it during your lifetime, they just look back, what did you pay for it? What did you sell for it? And even though there are a few adjustments to that, basically that's your profit on the sale. Right. And if you transfer it to your children during your lifetime, your children have your same tax basis. So you transfer it to them and then they hold on to it for another 20 or 30 years. When they sell it, your capital gain or their capital gain, they're gonna look way back to what the parents paid for it. Mm. I have situations where parents paid maybe 50 or $60,000 for a home that's now worth six, $700,000. So the capital gain on that would be huge. And the taxation rate on that is also huge. Between mm -hmm. California state and federal, about 30% of the profit is mm -hmm. going to go out the door. Now, if they don't put their children on title, but instead they do some estate planning so that the transfer occurs after they pass away, the capital gain is not measured from what the parent paid for it way back here. Mm -hmm. It's measured from the value of the property at the date of death. So you can imagine with most people that have built up hundreds of thousands of dollars of equity in their property, mm -hmm. the tax savings to their children by receiving it or having it transferred to them after death, the tax savings many times are hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right. So somebody decides I'm going to save a few thousand dollars by not going to an estate planning attorney and they make a mistake that costs their children potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it's not a common, not an uncommon mistake. I've seen it several times in my practice. 
Thank you for that. Thank you for that very clear answer. Now, we talk, you mentioned during the answer some things, you know, like, okay, there's other vehicles that you can use instead of putting your children on. Um, and one of those vehicles we know is, is a living trust. Uh, so um, we have spoken during this show many times about what a living trust is, but something that I wanted to talk to you about, and I think that a lot of listeners are, um, unfortunately, do make that mistake, is like they go to a tr estate planning attorney, they do the trust, and then they don't fund it. So uh, here's something that you know I wanted you to talk about, and 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 what is the um, what are the solutions? What are the implication, basically, of essentially relying on a pour over will or or you know an extant petition, for instance? Well, okay, something that sounds simple, but people have difficulty understanding it, mm -hmm. is that when you create a living trust, that is a legal entity that's completely separate from you. Right. That's why it works. That's why you probate is void. It is because it that asset didn't belong to you when you died, because mm -hmm. if it belongs to you, it's got to go through probate. Right. But if it belongs to your trust and you pass away, the owner didn't die. The right. owner is your trust. Now, here's the thing. Assets don't magically become owned by somebody's trust. Just right. because you created trust, things don't automatically belong to it any more than if I tell my child, I'm going to make you the owner of my house. If I don't go and do a deed, giving them ownership, they don't own it. Right. There has to be something that transfers the assets into the trust once you create it, or the value of the trust goes away. Right. Now, with most attorneys, when they create the trust, if a, the client owns property, they will make sure that the real property is transferred into the trust. Now, I've seen instances where attorneys did not do this. They left it up to the client to do the deed. And I think that that's a bad, bad mistake. But right. um, in almost all cases, if you're dealing with a reputable estate planning attorney, they will make sure that your real property gets transferred into the trust. But the attorney doesn't have authority to transfer bank accounts into the trust, or if you have a stock account, mm -hmm. the attorney can't do that for you. Those are steps that you have to take yourself. The other thing would be a few years down the road, you decide you're going to sell the, your home that's currently in the trust. You have to make sure that the new home that you buy is what we call titled in the trust mm -hmm. so that it doesn't show up with just your name on the deed. It shows your trust on the deed so that the trust will own it. You can buy and sell property hundreds of times. And as long as you have a new deed that shows the trust as the owner, you don't have to go back and change the trust. The trust owns it if the deed says it belongs to the trust. That makes sense. That makes total sense. Now, that is an instance where there is an acquisition of wealth. But what we have seen that happens often in people's lives normally is um, not just the change of assets, but also the change of in somebody's life, like a, a divorce or a separation. So could you elaborate on some of the mistakes uh, that people make and that you have seen um, when somebody either has a divorce or you know decides to separate from a partner or some of these life-changing events? Yeah, it can happen both both directions, uh, where there's marriage, where there's a divorce, sometimes there are mistakes made. Let, let's start out with a marriage situation. Let, let's say we've got a husband and wife, they're later on in years, they each have assets, maybe they each have an estate plan, saying this is what we want to have happen with our assets when we pass away. They get married, and they don't do anything to their estate plan. Let's say that they've agreed, look, yours is yours, mine is mine, mine goes to my kids, yours goes to your kids. Right. But they don't do anything to change their existing plan. If the plan is dated before the marriage and the person that created that plan passes away with a surviving spouse, 
that spouse is entitled under the law to the same percentage of that person's estate he or she would have received if there had been no estate plan in place at all. Mm. And in those types of situations, that can mean that the spouse would be entitled to anywhere from, depending on the number of children, if there are no children, she gets the whole thing. Right. If there's one child, she gets half of it. If there's more than one child, she gets a third of it. And that's the law. So the important thing is that if it's your intention to make sure that the new spouse does not receive a share of the estate, you have to go in and say, hey, I got married. Here's my spouse's name. Here's the date we got married. But I'm intentionally not leaving her my separate property. And that's not being mean. It, in the example I gave, this spouse already has assets of her own. Right. So that's the situation that is a common problem when somebody gets married, but they don't go back and change their existing plan. The other thing would be when you divorce or separate, I've had mm -hmm. situations where husband and wife have been separated literally for decades. They haven't had anything to do with one another mm -hmm. for a long, long time, but they didn't get divorced. And one of them passes away with no will. Mm. The law says your spouse is entitled to a share of your estate. It doesn't say your spouse that you've been happily married to up until the moment of death. It just <laughs> says your spouse. Right. Okay. Now, you could have done an estate plan that says, hey, everything that I now own, it's all my separate property, and I'm leaving it all to my children. If you've got a will or you've got a trust that specifies that, no problem. If you have nothing, though, big problem. Understood. Now, because you mentioned, and this isn't necessarily a, 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 a direct segue from, you know, when you're saying, I am getting remarried and, you know, I, whatever is my separate property, it's mine, whatever it's my new wife's separate property, it's hers. But I wanted to just briefly talk to you about the matter of disinheritance, which happens. I've encountered during my career uh, selling trust and probate real estate quite a few times where one of the beneficiary or like, ra rather there's only like one beneficiary when there are two kids. One of them is like a drug addict or something like that. And the parents were like, look, we're not leaving anything. My daughter lived with me. She took care of me for the past 10 years of my life or whatever the thing. When you have this situation there, when a client comes to you and says, look, I want to disinherit one of my kids or somebody, um, what are your recommendation, how they can go about that so that there is less of a chance of a challenge when the time comes? Well, yeah, the first thing that I let them know is that it is their property. They have the legal right to leave it to whomever they choose. They can right. leave all of their children out if they, right. if they want, and they can leave it to their neighbor or leave it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's their decision. But what I strongly recommend clients do, if they're going to do something that's unpopular, mm -hmm. is that they have the fortitude to tell the child what they've done. That goes a long way toward avoiding a lot of litigation later down the road. Uh, I've had some situations where I've encouraged the parent to do that. And they've said, look, I, I can't even talk to my child. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes you can put some veiled language in the trust itself or the will itself that, uh, you know, I'm disinheriting this one and the reasons are well known to them, although right. you don't need any reasons. Sometimes if I think that there's going to be a challenge, I recommended that they just draft a letter in their own handwriting that explains the details mm. of why they did what they did. And then we'd seal that envelope and put it with the estate plan and say to be opened only if there's a contest. Ah, and that's clever. I, I've never had to actually open the envelope, mm -hmm. but... Uh, 
that that is one solution that I've seen used. Thank you for sharing that with us. One more thing that I wanted to ask you about is sometimes, at least in my experience, um, I've sold estates where a large portion of it goes to charity. Actually, like in, in I've sold some estates there that were considerable where actually everything went to charity. When you have a client who you know needs to plan for charitable giving, let's say, is there a difference in the approach that you have when dealing obviously with an entity in that case, not with a specific beneficiary? Um, and since you will be involved in the trust administration, you know, what are some of the things that somebody should be aware of when they plan on giving some of their assets to charity? Depending on the size of the estate, giving to charity may or may not have any tax impacts. Mm -hmm. um, I would always recommend that somebody that is making gifts that in their mind have some tax motivation behind them. I would always tell them, you need to speak with a tax specialist. For instance, I do a lot of estate planning, but most of the, almost all of the estate planning that I do is for people in middle income brackets. Right. Uh, these are not extremely wealthy people and you have to be extremely wealthy. And we're talking north of $12 million net right. worth now before estate taxes become a concern. The other thing would be, and I'm always careful on this when somebody has a uh, charity that they want to give to, mm -hmm. um, I will tell them, don't just tell me the name. I want you to go online and I need you to get the exact name. Right. I need you to get the address of their current headquarters so that I'm going to put not only the name of the charity, I'm going to show their headquarters in the trust or the will, whichever document I'm drafting. I've got an estate that I'm handling right now where the creator of the trust left a gift. She left, named several charities. Mm -hmm. And one of them was, we don't know which one she intended it to. Uh, she, she was leaving it to a homeless shelter mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. And the wording that she used in it could have applied to one of two different uh, charities. We weren't sure which one she meant. We knew it was one of them, but we weren't sure. So I, in that case, I wrote a letter to both of them saying, look, we don't know and we're not going to decide you're either going to work this out between yourselves or we'll have to go to court and have a judge look at all the evidence, see if the judge can decide which one was intended. Now, I just heard back from the charities the other day and they said, we've just decided we'll split the gift. And that solved the problem. Good. But it doesn't really solve the problem in the sense that the one that created the trust really only intended that it go to one of those charities. Right, right. And so her wishes were to that extent defeated because she didn't correctly identify the charity. Got it. Got it. Okay. That makes total sense. Let's talk about you for a second. Let's talk about your journey. When you went to law school or before going to law school, did you plan that you were going to get into estate planning? Was that, was that your idea or did, uh, how did you become involved with, in this world? Well, you know, I tell people that uh, when I went to law school, people would ask me what type of law I wanted to practice. And I said, I'm not real sure, but I don't want to do bankruptcy and I don't want to do divorce. Well, you know that for the next 25 years after that, my <laughs> practice was primarily divorce and bankruptcy. They, they also said, where do you want to practice? And I said, uh, anywhere in California except L.A. So. <laughs> You know where I ended up. Uh, uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's the beginning of things. But as I uh -huh. went along, I was a general practitioner. So I was doing a little bit of everything. And got it. so early on in the practice, I had people that wanted to do wills. And then eventually I had people that had a little larger estate. They wanted to deal, uh, set up a living trust, I had to scramble and figure out how to do this, talk with right. other attorneys. And I, I learned how to do it. And I, over the course of years, I worked at times with other attorneys, other times on my own. I've been on my own now for the last 25 years, but I learned how to do estate planning. And uh, about 
10 or 15 years ago, I decided that I'd uh, spent enough time with uh, family law, you know, child custody battles and things like this that can be very wearing on you emotionally as the attorney. Mm -hmm. It's a high intensity type of practice. I'd gone through some health issues and I wanted to get a little less uh, stressful right. a practice. So I, I moved over to focusing on estate planning and probate and trust administration, which I have to let you know, did not get rid of all the stress. People <laughs> are people. And right. uh, I, I had some extremely, extremely contentious family fights that went on in the probate courts. Now, at, at this point, I've even washed my hands of litigation. So I don't do that anymore. I'm getting to the, uh, I guess, the twilight of my years <laughs> in practice. And I uh, have done a lot to just minimize the amount of conflict that I handle. Got but it. Yeah. That 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 makes that makes total sense. I, I like I like it. You know, you didn't want to do a certain kind of law. That's a, it, it. Always ends up that way. It's it, it, it's great. Got uh, got to be careful what you say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Be careful what you resist, right? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Okay, so here's a little a little game I like to play at the end of the show with with my guests. I have a list of of thirty questions, number from one to thirty. I want you to pick a random num number, and I will ask you that question. <laughs> Uh, well, I have to, let, let's uh, just uh, challenge all the odds. I'll choose lucky number 13. All right, lucky number 13. Has reading a book ever changed your life? Yes, uh, I mean, profoundly. Um, okay. And uh, the book is the Bible. All right, yes, I've, absolutely. I've, I've read it many, many times, and it... Uh, it not only has changed my life, it pretty much guides my life. Oh, now, if you're cool. looking for something, asking, is there a novel that I've read that has changed my life? Oh, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. It was, it was just a book. However, since now you brought it up, if there is a novel, let's talk about it. <laughs> now, that's a little tougher one to to think about, uh, although I, I think that it's kind of interesting. I went for years and years going to college and law school, and then even after law school, I had absolutely no time to of read course. anything for pleasure. Right. And I really had to kind of laugh at myself. The first book that I read for pleasure after probably 10 years was one that most kids hated reading when they went through high school and that was Charles Dickens, David Copperfield. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I, I don't know that that necessarily changed my life, but it was, uh, it opened up to me uh, a world of classic literature that uh, is actually my favorite, favorite area of reading. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to have you on the show. Time has really flown. Before I let you go, we're going to have your, your contact information, uh, your website and everything in the show notes. Before I let you go, can you let our audience know what is the best way to get a hold of you? Well, best way, you, if you want to call, you can call. Perfect. Uh, and the phone number will be in the, in the show notes. Um, you can always email me at the email address. You can go to my website that uh, has a number of blogs up there. Uh, there may be information that you'd find helpful. And that's yeah. harrimanlaw.com. Harrimanlaw.com. Yeah. And there, there is a box on there that you can click to contact us, and you can send an email through that way if, if you like. Perfect. Thank you so much for being on the show. It's been a pleasure to have you. And thank you, everybody who's joined. And we will see you on the next episode. Bye. So long.